Good morning, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, uh, it's a privilege to have uh, one of my, I would say, my teacher, um, my examiner, actually, as a moderator on this session, Professor Dongo. Uh, you have my respect, sir. Um, I will be looking at the topic, outcome assessment in unilateral cleft lip surgery. Uh, last week, Monday, uh, I listened to Dr. Afiaro, who shared a presentation on a very, practically the same topic. And actually, I was asking myself whether there was still a need for me to go on with the topic. Much more, I was wondering why Dr. Afiaro, uh, myself, had to think along the same way uh, giving this lecture. But at the end of our presentation, I was able to identify a common factor why Dr. Afaro and myself would uh, actually think along the same line by coincidence. At the end of this presentation as well, that common factor shall be identified. So let me start by giving gratitude to the Smile Train uh, for the opportunity, first of all, to make this presentation today in this telecleft series. Uh, but much more for the investment of Smile Train in uh, facilitating my acquaintance with the cleft surgery itself. That investment was uh, facilitated by the late Professor Hans Thomas Jackson, to whom I give homage posthumously today. He is a benefactor and a mentor like no other. I had attended the European Association for Cranial Maxillofacial Surgery Conference in Barcelona. Uh, I think in 2006, shortly after my fellowship. And I, I was sitting alone here on this table. Uh, since I, I looked around at that point, I was about the only black person I could see. I've uh, been trying to interact, but I uh, wasn't quite getting attention. So I sat alone here. And then Professor Jackson came along with his wife, Majori, and then this friend, and they said, got, got talking with me. At the end of the day, he was excited that this young guy was so zealous about learning, and he said, he was going to facilitate my coming over to his, his, his practice in Southwest Michigan. And he did that through the sponsorship of Smile Train, on which board I think he was at the time. So I owe him a lot for all that I have been involved, all my cleft surgery career. I owe it a lot to Professor Jackson. Now, today's lecture are uh, for the following objectives. I will be focusing specifically on the management of unilateral cleft lip. And the focus will be, the intention will be to further ventilate on the importance of the outcome assessment and reporting in cleft care. Also, to appraise the status of outcome assessment and reporting in the subregion, uh, particularly the West African subregion. Uh, I would also uh, be highlighting a comparative difference between. VRC, which is the virtual rating chart created by Dr. Luzonya and myself, uh, and uh, comparing that with some other qualitative uh, assessment tools that are existing in the literature. But much more importantly, I, I will be presenting a virtual rating chart as a viable option for outcome assessment in unilateral cleft lip surgery, uh, while also advocating the adoption of this tool, this instrument or its modification as a standard for outcome reporting in the subregion and then possibly beyond. Uh, you would ask, uh, pardon me for that, because uh, this was a product of my uh, research with Dr. Lusoya in Badon. And uh, having created uh, this, this uh, instrument, I think it's just appropriate for us to as well market it. And so it's my intention, therefore, by way of disclosure, to market the visual rating chart to colleagues. And I'm hoping that in the sub-region, at least to start with, it can be something we find useful for cleft outcome assessment. So this is my content layout by way of outline, I mean. Uh, why outcome assessment? Uh, I would love to ventilate a bit about that further. Uh, the tools that are available, which again, might uh, you may have to pardon, could be a bit repetitive, uh, but the focus and emphasis will be a bit different from uh, Dr. Afiaro's presentation of last Monday. Then I want to describe what I call the ideal characteristics of an outcome assessment instrument. You look at the limitations or the challenges to uh, instruments of assessment in this kind of situation. 
I will uh, outline some of the common anatomical pathologies that we find in secondary cleft situation. That is, after primary repair, what are residual anatomical pathologies that are often seen. Then, of course, I will do a quick uh, appraisal of outcome assessment research in the subregion, looking in the literature, what I've been able to find as what colleagues have tried to do in the subregion as with respect to outcome of unilateral cleft lip. Uh, repair assessment. But much more importantly, like I said, I will be discussing the visual rating chart, which is a product of our own effort, uh, describing the rigors and the, if we went through and the justifications we have to advocate its adoption for use in the subregion. Uh, further on that is by is that I'll be able to compare this visual rating chart with other existing qualitative uh, assessment tool like the Asha Magdal Aesthetic Index, the Pennsylvania Lip and Nose Scores, you know, Unilateral Cleft Lip, Surgical Outcome Evaluation Instrument, as well as the PERS scoring system before making my final conclusion. So let's start by way of introduction. We're looking at why why outcome assessment? Uh, last week, Dr. Uh, Afiaro, like I said, did a good uh, justice to, uh, uh, you know, identifying and highlighting the reasons why assessment, uh, outcome assessment is important. And uh, she talked about stuff like uh, the need for us to learn, the need for us to improve uh, practices, and then, of course, issues of value-based payment, which is about putting your money where good results come from. Those are very valid, very genuine reasons. And I'm going to uh, for the buttress this uh, reason for outcome by looking at some of what I've highlighted here. First of all, I talk about multiplicity of tricks and techniques. Uh, the cleft surgery itself is one procedure that lends itself to multiplicity of tricks and techniques. Uh, surgeons, in the bid to improve outcome, observe one little shortcoming or the other and think of devising means of correcting such. And so you could have as many techniques for cleft lip repair as there are surgeons actually. And I would say that the only reason why there should be a reason, a need for us to try inventing and reinventing techniques is because we want better outcome. And so, are there justification for these new techniques here and there? It is only the end that justifies the means. So, a, a technique, a new technique is unnecessary if it doesn't improve the outcome. And so, cleft surgery, uh, it's one that will require outcome assessment in order for us to be able to tell whether these new techniques are necessary or not. Then I talk about the total cost of a cleft repair. Uh, Generally speaking, when you talk about cost of cleft repair, people say, how much does it cost to repair a cleft? Um, courtesy of smart train, that's not the question we get often from patients these days, but it, it's actually a German reason, a German question, because people want to know how, how much does it cost? But we think immediately in terms of Naira value or, or, or uh, currency value of what it is worth to fix a cleft. But I think the cost is much more. Uh, there's a cost to the surgeon. I have talk, talked about my own narration of how I got acquainted with cleft surgery uh, via the effort of Ian Jackson. It took me about six months of leaving my family uh, to hand training and all of that. That's a cost to the surgeon. That's a cost to even the, the patient. You know, the cost of the pain you go through, going under anesthesia and all of that, it's a cost. And of course, to the parents or guardian, some have to abandon their work, their, their, their duties, their economy, to be able to attend to this cleft patient while undergoing treatment, it's a cost. And of course, the cost to the sponsor itself, where SmiteRing comes in here, this can be very humongous. And I think it would just be foolish for any people to invest so much in materials, in money, in effort, in time, and not be interested in what is produced at the end of the day. So it's actually very important, therefore, to know whether all these investments from every party is actually worth it. 
by looking at the outcome. What do I get at the end of the day? In the same line, I talk about a cleft repair, it's a life repaired. That actually is true, but only if the outcome justifies all the efforts at repair. So when you do, when you do cleft repair in a child that is congenitally malformed, and at the end of the day, the quality of life is not improved, the general health well-being is not improved, the overall quality of life is not improved because either a speech, a serial speech concerns, or even aesthetic concern that does not still allow this person to live maximally, enjoy a social activity to the, to the peak, uh, or, or have the psychological confidence to, to forge ahead in life, then it's a waste. So outcome is assessment, therefore, is important for us to ensure that at the end of the day, we actually repair life and not just repair a, 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 some kind of malformed tissues. Of course, the smile train concept is betrayed, like I said, if there is no smile at the end of the day, the whole concept of smile train is that at the end of the day, the patient can be happy, then can smile, then can be confident. If at the end of the day, after all this said and done, the patient still cannot smile, then it's actually a betrayer of the ideology of smile training itself. So outcome assessment, therefore, is very germane, especially even for smile training as a sponsor. There are also dimensions to outcome. And when we're looking about outcome assessment, we have to be multidimensional in our, in our appraisal. There are aesthetic outcomes and functional outcomes. There are that psychological component which tells about patient satisfaction. And it has to be said that these things are not exactly the same. You may have what you consider aesthetically satisfactory, but the patient is still not psychologically satisfied. And so these are different dimensions of outcome, the general well-being, residual natural obstruction. Uh, do we have auditory problems, you know, as a result of the cleft, even after it has been fixed? What is the overall quality of life of the patient? These are different dimensions to outcome assessment that must be ventilated. Now, talking about the tools, there are quantitative, qualitative, and I also dare say there are mixed form of tools, mixed form of assessment, which have not been uh, uh, ventilated as much. Quantitative are basically anthropometric uh, methods of determining the outcome of cleft. These are precision, precision assessment and different methods listed here have been used. Some are straightforward clinical measurements from using anatomical landmarks and taking actual measurements to compare symmetry of both sides in, in a patient, especially in unilateral cleft situation. Whereas some have, in fact, these days are digitized, you know, using different web-based software, you know, to actually superimpose a repaired cleft on the normal anatomy in the same population to compare for symmetry, whether there's actual correction. Now, these kind of uh, procedures are, like I said, highly technically sensitive, sometimes equipment dependent. And you know, by the time you begin to get the X axis, take actual measurement of the, uh, the, the, the the height of the nose, the columnar length, you know, and all of that, taking angles, you know, the curvature of the nose, the angles, and all of that. These are high tech thing, and I dare say, uh, only useful to the clinician, uh, the the patients, the relation, and the lay people looking at that patient are not quite concerned about what acute angle or obtuse angle you have been able to recreate. And so the quantitative uh, anthropometric approach is essentially uh, for research as far as uh, our concern or maybe to the interest of the surgeon or the clinician. Now, the qualitative, which I, I call the anthropomorphic, are basically to look at the morphological uh, concerns that are left after an initial cleft repair or before, and then to look at how that can be evaluated. And there are different techniques, which I will come back to later. But let me quickly talk about the mixed, which have not been often ventilated upon. I call that the metromorphic approach. And uh, an example is the Stevenson uh, criteria. The Stevenson criteria looks about nine, nine morphological criteria to assess. The Hala base, the Hala dome, the Cupid one, and the rest of them. 
and it actually reports them in terms of whether the appearance is good, is average, or is poor. Uh, you can see, for example, a good alert is at the same level as the normal side. A good alert dome is equal curvature as the normal side. Now, these are qualitative descriptions, but look at the average component. It says it must be a difference. It must be within a difference less than one mm compared to the normal side. Now, this requires measurement, and that's a metric form. It's an anthropometric thing. You can see the same goes like in the loop length. Talk about the shorter than clips side by greater than one mm. So you have measurements as well. You have qualitative assessment and all of that. So this is a kind of mixed model, and that also has been used by some researcher. Now coming back to the qualitative, which is actually the subject of my emphasis today, uh, we're looking at stuff like the Ashamakta D, the Pennsylvania Lip and Nose Score the unilateral cleft deep surgical outcome evaluation, the PAT scoring system, which I think is the baby of them all because it was just published this year, 2020. And of course, our own visual rating chart, which I'm going to be uh, elaborating much more about today. My view is that if you are actually talking about what mode of assessment is clinically applicable, very, that makes, that appeals to, to real life, something you can you can use readily in the clinic and communicate to colleagues we should be looking at the quality qualitative assessment i will begin to look at some of them now starting with the asha makdade aesthetic index uh, which was published first by asha makdade at all in 1992 there are four components that they looked at the nasal form nasal deviation the vermilion border and the profile they make use of a frontal photograph of the patient and a profile photograph to assess. Now, five grade index is described. Number one being the most aesthetic. Some will say excellent, some say very good. To the number five, which is the least aesthetic, some would say poor. So it goes from like excellent to very good to good to fair to poor or something like very good to good to fair to poor to very poor. So this is how the Ashamakda day is reported in terms of how well aesthetic is this outcome. Is it good? It is very good. Now, you would agree with me that there are quite a number of shortcomings with the Ashamakda day. Uh, this in, first of all, it describes in terms of measures that does not transmit any message directly for example you say it's very good or you say it's fair but it does not tell me any anatomical concern that you have observed that makes it very good or very fair i'm going to talk more about this by the time i begin to compare each of these uh, indices with our own visual rating chart so but another thing that i could say here in terms of shortcoming to actually mark today is that being a picture of a patient okay of course, the Nasolabia area is cropped out, and uh, you look at this. Now, uh, I think the original, the original Atamakta day basically just required that you use the picture of the patient you want to, you want to, you want to assess and use it to judge. And it, however, it stresses the fact that that judgment must be made by experts, those who understand the anatomy and know what it should be. So this is another shortcoming of the Atamakta day procedure. I will elaborate more on its shortcomings later on. Now, Kuji Pass Jaktos modification. Uh, they made modification to the Akchamadadi's aesthetic index. And what they found, what they did was that they observed that using the Akchamadadi as a model of assessment, uh, it's difficult because it's just a, a product of imagination. If somebody tells you it's fair, it's a, it's a fair outcome or it's a good outcome, if you are not seeing that patient particularly, you won't know what the patient is looking at. And so what Kujipaya Jack Smal and his colleague did was to derive model photographs that represent different grades of Achamagdade using the four components that Achamagdade, you know, described, the NASA form. So they were able to describe, to, to, to create a, a, a crop pop picture that represents what you can consider excellent, for example or very poor or poor for example as well so they, they created a model picture like this for each of those indices vermilion border uh you know nasa profile and all of that 
and they believe that when you are holding this chart in your hand and you compare to the patient you are trying to assess, maybe the picture of the patient you are trying to assess, you'll be able to tell whether it's more like this one or more like this one to be able to say this is what uh, uh, this should be graded as or otherwise. So that was uh, Kujipel's attempt to improve on Magdalene's uh, aesthetic index by creating reference photographs to go with it. Now, the Pennsylvania Lip and Nose Score criteria, another popular index that have been used. Uh, this was well described by Kachner in 2007 when they visited Nigeria for the Pan-African Cleft Lip Meeting. And he described the research which they did using the Pennsylvania Lip and Nose Scoring Criteria. Now, there are two components, lip and nose. Now, what they do is to say, okay, the lip is, is graded as one when they think the deformity observed is mild. And what do they mean by mild? They say nearly imperceptible at conversational distance. That is to say, when you are looking at the person uh, at a conversational distance, I mean, first of all, this has to life conversational distance, you know. So you're talk, looking at the patient at the conversational distance, and you can identify almost not perceptible, but there is something there that is a residual deformity. You call that mild, and then of course moderate. If you have seen some kind of asymmetry that is notable as conversational distance and severe, when it's such a significant asymmetry, the same goes for nose, you know, and along that way, and. They, they, this kind of index basically um, is trying to uh, describe based on basic qualitative description, mild, moderate. And when you say acceptable as conversion, what are you perceiving? It does not communicate immediately what is the residual deformity. It doesn't communicate what is the concern, but it's just a report giving an idea of how somebody sees that. You know, that also has been validated in some studies and it's been found useful but those are some of his shortcomings now the unilateral cleft lip surgical outcome evaluation scale by campbell et al described in 2007 is what i could want to say admit that it's an attempt to improve on what we did in the visual rating chart however uh, i still observe some shortcomings with it for which i think our visual rating chart still has some relative advantage now, what this assessment procedure did, uh, is trying to do, is to use some basic morphological uh, landmarks to assess outcome. The nose, the cupid's bow, the lateral leaf, and the free vermilion border. Now, they use the picture of the patient, both in frontal view and the basal view, or what we want to call the worm's eye view. To look at the nose from the base. Now, you put the two together and then assess this component. The nose, for example, they're looking at three things the vertical symmetry of the cleft side compared to the non cleft side, the vertical symmetry, the horizontal symmetry, as well as the ilar base position. So, you want to consider symmetry along that line. And you, they score two if there's both as everything is symmetrical, they score one if one of the components, maybe there's vertical symmetry but no horizontal symmetry. Maybe the other bits are still symmetry. If one of them is out of place, then they scored one and they scored zero. If two or more of these is out of base, the same they go, goes for Cupid's bow. They, they, they looked at the Cupid's bow uh, in terms of the fetal the fetal ridge, the, the scar of the fetal ridge. Are they symmetrical with the non cleft side, or and then they also look at the the the, the, the white row or the of the cupid's area, whether it's even, is properly aligned, you know, and they score if it is everything is well aligned as two. If one is not normal, whether the either the the, the filter reach or the evenness of the, of the cupid of the of the white row, uh, then they score one. And then if both of them are out of alignment, then they score two by zero. The same for lateral leap, They look at the leap length from the commissure to the uh, filter height there, uh, the cupid bow 
and then they, they compare to both sides. And then, of course, the vertical fullness of the leaf, whether it is notched or it is shortened compared to the normal side. And then they also scale along that say, line. And then same thing for vermilion evenness. They look at the vermilion, is it smooth or is it dented or notched? And then it's called along the same line. Now, one of the problems is that at the end of the day, how is the outcome reported? It's recorded based on the total score, zero to eight. So the score zero, zero, zero is going to get zero, meaning it's a perfect situation. But if the patient gets anything, you sum up together and you get a score. And then they say, this is the score of the patient is the level of uh, aesthetic outcome, whether it is very important or not, it is the sum of the score. And uh, for this kind of index to be clinically useful, you will need to have one of the score right before you, uh, uh, and not just the outcome score, the sum score, which they use as to determine the aesthetic grid of that repair. Uh, because it is only when you know what it's called in Nissal in Kupi's book that you can identify what the actual problem, the morphological problem is. Uh, however, like I said, these pictures are very beautiful. Uh, and they, these are like a 3D picture to show these things and makes it very attractive index uh, use. Uh, one other problem I identify with it, which again I'll ventilate when I begin to compare is that they use pictures it's based on pictures immediate poster picture on the table with the tubes still in place so the patient is finished and the surgery is finished and you snap and that's what they used to compare you and i know that in real life practice what happens on what we see on immediately after surgery on the table is usually not quite representative of what the patient have three months four months after uh eudema and some of the uh you know it's difficult to quite appreciate that and so uh, for me, I, I think that uh, that is a bit of a shortcoming on the part of that uh, scale. Now, another index, which is, uh, like I said, just came out this year, is the uh, PET scoring system. The PET scoring system by Moshizade and Vijaya Sekaran, you know, basically also try to use morphological structure of the other point insertion and then, I mean, other, other insertion point and the leaf length, white row, and vermilion to describe aesthetic outcome. For the other insertion, for example, he said this position is similar to the other side, it's zero. If it's similar position but on equal nostril no width, then it's one. And then if they are different position and width, then it's two. For the leaf length, they talk about equal length and good scar, zero. Equal leaf length but poor scar. You know, and all of that. So they use a uh, description for each of these items to grade them. For so leaf length, they have about three or uh, four gradings on it. For white row, they have about three gradings on it. For million, they have about three gradings on it. And so at the end of the day, they also sum up the total. And you can get from zero to, to nine. Zero being the best, nine being the worst. So when it's reported, it's reported as PSS uh, value of four or five or six. Now, again, like I said, for the UCLSO here, SOE, this do not tell immediately what is the morphological problem. You also need to know the individual score of this item. It has to be broken down for you to be able to know, okay, what are the morphological problems with it. Another problem I identify with this one is over concentration on the leaf. You see, it's, it's, it's more on the leaf out of the four indices. Three of them are on the leaf, while only one is on the nose. So uh, it's nice. It's been validated. But I also think that these are some of its shortcomings. Now, having described these indices, what do I consider ideal measurement tools? Some of these characteristics have been well identified in the literature, but I, I have added at least two more, uh, or perhaps three more, in this what I call the ideal characteristics of the measurement tool. Now, if an ideal measurement tool should be valid. And validity here refers to being able to measure what it is set out to measure. For example, the materials or the tools, instruments we have described here so far, are qualitative to assess aesthetic outcome. So this instrument must actually measure aesthetic outcome, not functional outcome, not psychological outcome. So it must be valid. 
to measure exactly what we want it to measure. So the other thing is that it must be reliable. And reliable talk about consistency. It must at all times be able to measure and get the same result. For example, if I look at this patient today and say it is qualified, if you give me the same patient five years' time in the same condition and I appraise, I should still be able to score five. But given any man here up, a difference of maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.0, or maybe one, I should, I should be near the same way I've affected before. That is consistency. That is reliability. Reliability can be internal, that is to say, intra examiner, in which case it is the same me looking at it now and later, or inter examiner or inter observer. In which case, if I look at it and think it is five, if another person looks at it, she also gets five or six, something very close by, a range that is acceptable. You know, that shows that that tool is actually reliable. So a good assessment of a tool must be reliable. Multidimensional, this is one of the things I, I, I'm ventilating upon. That is to say, a very good and ideal assessment tool should be able to have a global look at outcome, aesthetically well function, psychology, quality of life, you know, and all of that. Uh, most of the outcome assessment tools, including the VRC that I'm about to, I'm, I'm trying to market, you know, are unidimensional. They are purely aesthetic. There are aesthetic, there are outcome assessment for speech. There are asset assessment for other functions, maybe masticative functions, maybe nasal breathing and all of that. There could be assessment to develop for all of this. That a good and ideal one would have been one that would be encompassing. And I think from what I have seen so far, the cleft Q uh, assessment criteria, which uh, Dr. Fierro also talked about last Monday, is uh, perhaps the only assessment protocol uh, I could say so far appear multidimensional. Uh, it should be user friendly. That is to say, it should not be cumbersome to use for the person looking at it. You shouldn't require expertise to any high level, either as a professional, understanding anatomy and all of those things, or you have to compare this, look at so many pictures and all of that before you can use it. So that makes it cumbersome and it becomes less user-friendly the more you have to engage in terms of knowledge, in terms of materials, before you can apply it. I also say it should be clinically applicable. It should be something that in the clinical scenario, I can use to document. In the clinical scenario, I can be able to use it to compare for research and all of that. This is an ideal characteristic that I've been well identified. Also, I have included this, criteria, this criterion that should be communicative. And what do I mean by being communicative? If I say, for example, Ashamatadi, that I'm, I'm using Ashamatadi and I say it's a score of four. What does that tell any person? If I tell a person, don't call, I write a little person, don't call, I say, as a mad daddy or four. Fine, it probably tells him it's very poor or fair. But then, what was this man looking at that makes him say it's fair? He cannot interpret that from my report. So I believe that an excellent uh, uh, reporting tool should, when you say it is five, you should know that five means that the ALA base is wide without you even seeing the patient. If I write a referral to you and say I have achieved a, a VRC of L5, N2, you should say, oh, okay, that means the nose is wide or this is high or the lip is not, the white row is not symmetrical. That is communicative, a communicative tool. And that is one of the products, and that is one of the advantage of the VRC that we am, I'm about to promote. I also say it should be indicative. Being indicative means that when, you, when I say it's L5, for example, and you say, okay, L5 means that there is notching of the vermilion, a significant notching of the vermilion. Now, immediately it tells you if the vermilion is notching, what kind of surgery will this be required, will I require to do to correct this? You know what you can do to correct a vermilion? Am I going to be a, do a VY plasty? Am I going to do some Z plasty? Am I going to, immediately it indicates to you the kind of procedure you may need to do. And you can tell yourself, oh, or I'm not very skillful at doing this kind of correction. Okay, say the, 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 it's N5. That means the columella is shortened. Very good at lengthening columella. I won't be able to handle this. 
just by communicating to you that my outcome is N5. So that means that my outcome, my, my index indicates to you what kind of secondary procedure this patient may require. And so these are things I consider ideal for a good assessment tool. Having considered ideals, what are the things that can confound outcome assessment? I have listed a number of things here. Age, ethnicity, gender, clear severity. Now, these are some of the indices, uh, some of the factors or variables that sometimes contour our outcome assessment. For example, the actual Magda data tools must be used, the comparison has to be based on patients of the same age. So, and it was designed to look at student, uh, children in the uh, late adult uh, childhood or early adolescence. That was the original intent of the Actamagda Day tools. So it doesn't have universal application. Or when you are looking at this outcome in this patient and you are reporting five here, yeah, it has to be relative to the age of the patient you are look, talking about. Or even to ethnicity. For example, you look at the profile picture of an European to an Asian to an African. The profiles are naturally different. And so if you are using a the reference photograph, for example, as suggested by Kujibas modification of Achamagdadi, and you are looking at the profile to compare whether I, you should give me five or four. But by way of my natural genetical uh, disposition, I'm supposed to have a straight uh, profile, you know, and you are using a photograph, a reference photograph that is based on a European picture, you can't really have good assessment of me. So these are confounders. Gender can be a confounder. And then clear severity. Some of these indices compare, uh, for example, P a, 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 a plan, which is Pennsylvania, at original design was to compare patients pre-operative, that is the original clear severity, with the outcome that you get. So you compare the outcome, you give it maybe one, and then you compare the, I mean, you compare the original clear severity, it's called maybe one, and then you now compare the outcome, and that, that will determine that whether you have good results or not. Now, a good outcome assessment should have no consideration for whatever it was. A, patient, a, a, a lay person that meets the patient on the road does not care or knows how wide his cleft was before it was repaired or how narrow it was. He just wants to see somebody that looks like a normal human being. And so a good cleft uh, outcome assessment should not you know, be related to about whether cleft severity or not. Those things have importance for clinical evaluations, for research, for improvements, fine. But in terms of general assessment of outcome, they should not have bearing. Technique, oh, either you use Venice Randall, Tennyson Randall, or Millards, or Mullards, or Fisher, or whatever you use. The important thing is that you want to get this person back to normal anatomy. Therefore, if the outcome does not simulate normal anatomy, it's not good enough. Uh, whether you use anything, the patient is not interested in the technique you use, just get me back to normal. So your assess, as, outcome assessment modality, therefore, must focus more on look, the return to normal morphology rather than what technique and all that is used. As part is, how good the surgeon is, or material use, whether you use a, a vicryl or anything, uh, or, or, or nylon, something that can worsen your scar, it should not really affect the outcome assessment. The surgeon should put in the best, use the appropriate material so that outcome can be assessed fairly. Now, just trying to list some of the, what we know as the normal, usual uh, secondary deformities, anatomical pathology that we find after primary cleft repair. Bilateral morphological asymmetry is not uncommon. Deviation of NASA primary, NASA tip, you know, projection, the tilt, especially on the cleft side. The soft triangle is maybe depressed, dimensional dissimilarity of the venal base. For lip, short lip, lip tightness, bad scar, vermilion insufficiency, and all of that are some of the things we see. You can see sometimes the, 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 the ala cartilage, uh, the, the media cruise is still not lifted to, to simulate the other side. And so you still have depression. You can have loss of bulk along the line of suture with notching of the vermilion. These are some of the things that are often noticed in secondary cleft uh, situation. Now, having identified all of those, I am looking at the, uh, I want to look at outcome assessment research in our subregion. What has been done so far? Now, the first article uh, I'm looking at is the one by Taiwo Abdurazak and et al. 
and they looked at surgical outcome and complications following cleft uh, lip and palate repair. In this study, they had about maybe 131 patients, including cleft lip and palate, where about 90 of them were actually cleft lip, unilateral cleft lip cases. Uh, out of these 92 patients, they found they used the uh, Pennsylvania lip and nose scores to assess outcome, and they observed 67.9% of them have what they call good outcome for lip and nose. Uh, of course, they observed that uh, NASA score was uh, poorer than nose than lip score, generally speaking. But their method mode of assessment for outcome is the, is the plan, uh, Pennsylvania, you know, and like I said, that outcome assessment is quite subjective. It just says mild, moderate. It doesn't tell you what is the residual deformity that needs correction and all of that. The other so, research, so you have uh, you, you you have five more minutes, please, Dr. Professor oh, Kadri. Oh, oh, okay. All right. By the by 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 the um, final okay, uh, not by the uh, Dr. Oti and Abri Yebua, in their own research as well, they use uh, visual assessment score. Uh, uh, the research also used satisfaction rating in another research, and then uh, Alukuluku as well used visual assessment rating uh, for time. And this also is another one. They used visual assessment rating. They, none of them use uh, very well conceptualized standard protocol. Now, talking about our visual rating chart, uh, which unfortunately I'm running out of time. Now, the visual rating chart is one we developed. Basically, we looked at the outcomes that we have seen over 200 cases. Uh, of after primary repair, and we identified some outcomes like uh, the, 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 the notching of the lip. Uh, this is the normal one, then the notching of the uh, unevenness of the white row, uh, residual defects in the uh, NASA floor, uh, the hissense or the root of the nose. Uh, sorry, this is, this is that one. Or here we have notching of the vermilion, which is doesn't reveal the teeth, or extensive notching. Uh, the same for the nose, we identified different abnormalities like that. And the first thing we did was to ask use some combination of lay observers, clinicians, and all of that nurses to rank order this severity, what they consider the worst. And it is based on the statistically proven ranking of the severity that we give these things scores, L1, 2, 3, or 4, and 5. L1, L2, so L2, 5, N1, N2, to N2, 5. Now, we are not going to look at the palate aspect uh, in this situation. Now, at the same thing, we are not going to look at the palate aspect. So what we then did was to pick some pictures randomly from our, our outcome uh, uh, pictures, and first of all, the two developers, myself and Dr. Lusonya, we now independently use that criteria to score these patients. You know, how do you grade these outcomes? And we score them. We are allowed a passing time of about two weeks, shuffle the mist, mist, mist them up at independently. She did her own, I did my own differently. And she scored again without reference to what they scored before. And then we use statistics to compare whether you were consistent in the first rating and first rating as intraexaminal outcome. Or, uh, and then whether the two uh, surgeons compare. After that, we now sent this thing to about 20, we recruited about 20 uh, judges from UCH, Ibadan, and Protocol Teaching Hospital. And we recruit a mixed judges, clinic, uh, nurses, uh, other hospital staff that are not, you know, are not that mixed judges. And we gave them the same pictures to score. And as you can see, the, the, A, the A1, for example, you can see one, 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 few are, discrepancy, you know, and all of that. At the end of the day, we did a statistical analysis and we found that our coefficient of reliability at single measure, meaning that when one individual assesses, is 0.77. And then average measure, if you are pulling average of two or three persons, is even much stronger at 0.9 with the comeback alpha of 0.98. I won't have time to talk about the statistics now. So this shows that this index VRC is very reliable. When you compare that, Okay, when you want to apply that clinically, what does it mean? For example, this one of the patient, you want to apply our VRC. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, you look at this, you can see that there's deep notching of the vermilion area. You can see deep notching of the vermilion area there. And by this assessment, it goes with this, N5, L5. And then when you look at the nose, you see there's a broadening of this base, but also there's shortening of the columella. By our standard, we say you use the you, you worst, the worst criterion, use it to score the end, the, 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 the morphology. So N now will be five because shorting columella is a worse criteria than widening base. But because there's an additional deformity, you are going to put a plus. So in this case now, we record L5 to N5 plus. Meaning that L5 this, describe this and N5 describes shorting columella plus means there are other abnormality which are not as severe as the one that we have registered. 
And then the total score for assessing the overall severity, you now sum them up. Five plus five is 10, so it's 10 plus. If this had been L5 plus, it would have been 10 plus plus. So when I send this to a patient, for, to somebody, for example, for this one, lip is L2, you know, when you look at unevenness, you can see that's the major worst situation there, unevenness of the right row. And then the nose, N1, looks almost perfect, the nose. So you say L2, N1, the overall score is three. So when I say L2, you, you already know that it's because the vermilion is not, uh, the white row is not even. And then the overall is three, the total severity. So with this kind of assessment, when I communicate to you, I say I have L5, N5, 10 plus. You already know that L5 means the not the familiar is not N5 means the columella is shortened, and then the worst the total severity is, is very, very severely uh, very bad with the term. This tells you exactly what it is. And I say it's indicative because it tells you what you need to do. In this kind of situation, for example, you may need to, you know, you, once you know that it's N5, columella is shortened, and then the base is widened, you may need to do this, release the attachment of the elevators and pull that back, make sure you do a down rotation or here, and then of course you need so you anchor at the arterial spine and all of that for time. Let me just rush for this one. For example, you know it's, a, it's an L L2. You know the white row is not it's not it's not uh, symmetrical. I mean it's not aligned. So you may need to do some Z plasty there. It tells you immediately what you may need to do. Okay, for time will fail me to begin to compare. But since I've been able to compare along the line, uh, what our VRC will do better than other ones, I will just uh, skip on this. But these are listed, uh, it's better if I did it, it's more communicative, it's more indicative. These are tables that where I'm trying to show uh, validity and reliability, ease of use, communicability, indica ind indicativeness, detail and multidimensionally. These are things I used to compare all of that in this is time we feel me to ventilate on them. But none of them is multidimensional, not even our VRC, but our VRC definitely is, more, is the only very communicative one that by the way it's important, you will know immediately what the problem is and can give you an idea of the kind of surgery you will need to do. Now, by way of conclusion, I'm trying to say that the VRC is the only, I mean, it's the only outcome assessment tool for cleft surgery so far developed in the subregion. From my literature research, I cannot find any indigenous outcome assessment uh, tools that have been developed in this subregion. It is a communicative outcome assessment tool because it tells you immediately what the defect, the problem is. And it informs of the kind of surgery that you need for further refinement, you know, for that procedure. So I say it is indicative. Then it shows high reliability, both in single measure and average measure. I would have shown the values getting from other studies with other, other, other indices, if I'm, I'm able to do that comparison, which time has failed me to do. But basically, you know, when you look at it, you find that our own rating is very high, even at single measure before pulling. Some of them require pulling of assessor before you can reach 0 0.5, 0 0.6. It's also not encumbered because you can see what we use was just schematic. We're not using pictures. Pictures tend to bias judgment. If you use a face to look at, to compare this outcome, you can, because it doesn't look exactly the same, you might have your biased judgment. But we are not using picture. It's just a textual description and then a schematic diagram. And just with that, you'll be able to make assessment. That's what we did. And we have this result from 20 recruited judges. Then I'm trying to say that a collaborative multicenter validation study it's required for the VRC. We want people to get to collaborate with us in validating this for use in their various practices, at least in the subregion. And then we, 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 with this, we are advocating that the VRC could be adopted as a reporting and comparison tool for, uh, for professional communication, you know, for referral and all those things amongst uh, practitioners. And I also say that it's time for us to have the Africa cleft. We have seen the Euro cleft, we have seen the uh, America cleft based on tools that developed in those uh, clients, we can also use have our own AFRICLEFT to assess outcome of our practices using an indigenous tool like the visual rating chart, which I've just described. In ending this presentation, let me extend my appreciation and acknowledgement to my very dear colleague, uh, Dr. Adeola Olusoya. I did say at the beginning that I was wondering why Dr. Uh, Afiaro and myself thought about the, the same topic. Now, this is the common factor. At the end of her presentation, she showed uh, Dr. Lusonia as one person she acknowledged as having worked with on this matter. She is also a common friend, therefore, to both of us. And I will say she, she, we, and she and myself developed the visual rating chart together. And she's an outcome person. She just wants to see results. She wants to see that whatever you have done, and we have had a fantastic partnership that are never ends. And I want to really appreciate you, Dr. Lusonia. Uh, this morning, I told my daughter, I said, that is going to present today. And he said, I said, pray for me, therefore. He said, oh, and he dropped his at her, let daddy do his presentation very well. 
and let him not forget anything that he has to say. I just want to hope that at the end of this presentation, I've made my presentation very well, and I have not forgotten anything that I needed to say. These are my references. I want to say thank you to you in different languages. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Merci. God bless you. Thank you very much. I'm done, Prof. Uh, okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry. My internet disappeared just at the moment that you're going to say your last uh, uh, lines. So thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that uh, Professor Kaderi has done justice to the topic that he was given, done a, a detailed exposition on uh, outcomes assessment of unilateral cleft lip surgery, um, and then presented his, their own experience uh, in, in Nigeria, and uh, uh, which unfortunately he would have loved to spend more time on, but uh, time didn't permit him to. Professor Donko, are you here? Okay, maybe I can start reading the questions while we are waiting for Professor Donko to recollect. So we have several questions here. Uh, the first one is from Tokumbu Adeyemi. He said, thank you for your presentation. You did mention some aesthetic measurements as qualitative outcome assessment for children with cleft lip and palate. Are you able to explain further the concept of qualitative methodology in the measurement of cleft lip and palate outcomes? Should I take this that right away? Question. Should I answer that right away? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, that's uh, rather, uh, I think it's rather straightforward. Uh, when we talk about quantitative assessment measures, me measurements, uh, we are looking at taking actual measurements. It's an anthropometric method. You want to compare the cleft side with non-cleft side. You want to see the width of the nose tube, for example. You want to see the columella height, for example, and you actually measure from one point to another on the non-cleft side and compare to the cleft side. So that way you can say whether you have achieved correction and to what extent you have achieved correction. The same goes for the leap and all of that. So that is a quantitative approach. And like I said, it's essentially good for research and all of that. But for qualitative, it's a global assessment. You want to look at something and say it's good. It's excellent. You want to say, it's, I give you five. I give you five how you judge it. So it's not actual measurement, but it's based on morphological appraisal to compare to normal. So that's what the difference is in terms of quantitative. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Another question here. What time lapse after surgery was the photographs taken that you used to measure the VRC outcome? Okay, thank you. Uh, the pictures taken uh, used for this outcome uh, a minimum of three months, three months, or even one year or thereabout. So they are actually long term pictures that we use for the VRC. Thank you. Another question here. Uh, she said, Thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. Just to know the percentage of palette revision you used. You have, sorry. Okay, like I said, this, this, uh, this presentation is focused on the clinical cleft lip alone. I didn't talk about palate, though the VRC also has the palatal component, but I am not ventilating on that because I just want to narrow down because of time, you know, to cleft, unilateral cleft lip. But in our, in our, in our study, uh, the, the, the palate uh, that we have there, what, that study is not based on how many required revision, how many required revision was an outcome assessment based on the result of palette that we have produced. But if you are asking in my experience, in terms of our own practice, what percentage of uh, cleft palettes uh, require revision? What I'm going to be saying would just be an estimate. It would be an estimate. And I may, I may, I may give it about, up, up to about 30% in our practice there, in our practice. But that is total practice for all of us that does cleft, uh, do cleft here. Individually, uh, but in my own personal experience, I have hardly, I have not done so much 
I've had not had so much need to revisit palette as much as possible. Okay. Uh, so another question back. here. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, the person is saying, thank you, Prof, for this wonderful presentation. I wish to congratulate you on the development of the VSEO. This is a comment. Okay, let's move on. Um, under which category will you put your VRC scale? Qualitative or quantitative? This is from Dr. Tokumbo Adeyemi. Sorry, I'm not getting you, I'm breaking. Okay, let me read again. He said, under which category will you put your VRC scale? Qu qualitative or quantitative? This is from Dr. Tokumbo Adeyemi. Yeah, as I've said again and again, it's a qualitative. It's, we're not taking actual measurements. It's qualitative. You know, it's just basically that we looked, we, we give number to the actual morphological, for example, is L5, you know, and we have ranked other that based on statistical, it's not arbitrarily. So it's a qualitative assessment. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Professor Donko is offline, unfortunately, so we will continue. I'll continue to read the questions and you will answer. Um, another question I saw this scale and was happy because it is easy and, e and easy to use, but I want to find out why the VRC was not the VRS was not validated immediately since most CLEF scoring systems validate theirs almost immediately. Okay. Sorry, I didn't get you. You want to find out what? He said, uh, I saw this scale and was happy because it is easy and easy to use. But I want yeah. to find out why the VRC, I don't know if uh, the person is talking about VRC or VRS. Uh, VRC. So he's, so uh, I want to find out why the VRC was not validated immediately since most CLEF scoring system validates theirs almost immediately. I, I, if I understand what you mean by validation, I don't know why you say it's not validated. The results, the, the, the study which I have said, which Dr. Lusa and I did, was a validation of the VRC. Most of these other indices they talk about, like the, um, the UCL, SOE, I talk about the Pennsylvania, were validated by the authors by putting them to use, giving them over to use, and getting the statistical reliability. That is exactly what we did. So the VRC is validated. What I'm asking for now, what we have done is a two-center validation between my center and the Tulsa center, who, where we are, uh, both quarters are from. So I'm just asking now that let's, we, are, we want to have a multi-center in the sub-region to use our VRC to validate it, you know, further validate it. So it has been validated. That's why we could report the, the The Kronbach Alpha score, the intra-class coefficient nine, you know, that's high indices compared to all other skills. I don't think anyone had a better reliability score than the VRC. So what we're saying is that it's now open. Having validated it, and we're sure that it's working, let's use it widely in all centers in the sub-region, and let's adopt it as our standard for Africa in the sub-region. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, someone is saying, sir, is this tool universally applicable to all regions? And what was the most significant common finding that you noticed in all regions in cleft cases? Okay, um, um, the, the, whether this tool is, 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 is as universal application, perfectly. You see, one of the things I said, as shortcomings to some of these other ones was, they use pictures, they use somebody's face, they do a, a profile. Now, that face will bias your assessment. Now, we have, not, we have removed every image bias. So it's a textual description, and then a diagrammatic drawing to show you what that textual description is looking about. So it's not for you to look at the individuals 
and interpret, you know, the representation of that person based on the text, uh, what we have talked about, and then the, what the diagram is trying to illustrate to you. So it has universal application. It has not talk to it, whether it's your Caucasian, whether it applies, because the anatomical landmarks used, white row, red line, are universal to everybody. So that is basically what it is. And in terms of what is the deformities that we notice uh, across regions. I mean, well, I work in this region, uh, but from literature, uh, you find that uh, the outcomes of cleft are quite, uh, they are quite the same, quite universal. So it's either you are talking about a based repositioning or uh, asymmetry, you are talking about height, you are talking about the dome shape, uh, whether it is depressed, or you are talking about the deep length, you are talking about the, the notching of the vermilion, the fullness of the vermilion, the loss of bulk. This, this, this is itemized in the presentation. The anatomical pathologies of cleft, primary cleft, and then the secondary cleft, when it has previously been repaired, are the same. The secondary thing is because certain things in the primary were not adequately corrected. So it's the same. That is what is found everywhere. But in terms of how frequent each of these things occur, that is a subject of study and may vary from center to center. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Another question I wish to ask, sir, how widely used and acceptable is the visual rating chart? either in the sub-region or the world over since its development? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, if the answer to that is that, oh, it's been widely used, in fact, I will not be interested in this presentation at all, or I will have been talking about something different. Now, the reason we are advocating it is because we think that it has not been appreciated for its value and has not been adopted for use. In actual fact, like I showed you, there are very limited outcome research in our sub-region. You know, I've seen just about five or six that I showed in this situation. So people are not doing outcome research. And many of those that are done, they just use arbitrary scale of visual assessment score, satisfaction, which are purely subjective, or the ones that use uh, material use plan. I uh, mean, Pennsylvania. Why Pennsylvania when there is a called Nigeria, if I don't, uh, visual score here? We, are, we, are, we decide. The Pennsylvania has a lot of shortcomings, which like I've... Presentation. I am saying that the BRC has been published in 2015, it was published, and we need to see people using it to develop outcome and feed us back. That's why I said the use of it or its modification. The feed can inform some modification, but I'm quite confident based on what we have seen that this BRC is likely to measure to any, any other. Hello, Professor Akadiri. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Hello, can everyone hear me? We can hear you, Nicole. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Akadiri, you have so many, many congratulations from the chat room. And I also add to those who sent, uh, I really want to appreciate and congratulate you on this presentation. It was uh, amazing. So thank you for the prayers from your daughters. <laughs> and we also send you all, all our prayers to them. I give you appointment to all the attendees tomorrow, same time, 11 a.m. Professor Donko is very sorry. His internet drop, on, drop off, so uh, he apologized. Uh, I wish you have a lovely day. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.